Hello everyone and welcome to the Vortex where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris and our continuing push here at Church Militant to keep you informed as much as we possibly can, we're dedicating resources to an ongoing project we call Turf War, largely an effort of our Church Militant Resistance where we hit the streets in various dioceses all around the country and get local. We visit with and get real with faithful Catholics on the ground, Catholics who know what's going on in their local church regarding corruption and big problem areas. We spend a few days with them to bring the story to you up close and personal. Recently, we went to Baltimore and discovered an enormous problem with the Maryland State Catholic Bishops Conference. The bishops need to understand that um, that we can't be played and that we shouldn't be played and that politics, they don't need to be, here's the thing, they don't need to be afraid. The statement is, well, if we took a bold stance, we won't get the deals we want in the back room. And the deals are what really saves us. The deal like not having uh, a look back tort on uh, the Sexual Predator Act. They want those deals and so they're publicly cautious to not shame anybody. And then they try to work out a deal in the back room. The problem with that is it's, a, it's almost a Marxist approach that gives the other side that two step forward, one step back. All they're doing is giving the other side that one step advantage every single time. And at the end of the day, you're gonna lose it all anyway. Right. The way to express our faith has got to be out from under the bushel. Our candle has to be lit. It's got to be clear. It's gotta be bright. And light will cause the darkness to flee. Absolutely. Because truth is on our side. Dan Cox, who you just saw there, is the Trump-endorsed candidate for the Republican nomination for governor of Maryland. So for him to make a statement like that is massively damning for Archbishop William Lorry. We think this story and this turf war is so important for you to watch that we are presenting this special first ever Saturday Vortex. The bishops need to understand that, um, that we can't be played. The statement is, well, if we took a bold stance, we won't get the deals we want in the back room. The deal like not having uh, a look back tort on uh, the Sexual Predator Act. This is almost a permission slip. This is communicating to the left that, yeah, you know we're against it officially, but we're not gonna mount an opposition. We're not gonna embarrass you. All they're doing is giving the other side that one step advantage every single time. And at the end of the day, you're gonna lose it all anyway. The Maryland Catholic Conference is doing virtually nothing about these abortion bills. They basically said, okay, we're not gonna deal with these abortion bills if you squash the hidden predator bill and keep people from suing the diocese because we're gonna go bankrupt. Although they own the land rights from downtown Baltimore out into, into, into Allegheny County, okay? So the, the Archdiocese of Baltimore is not going to go bankrupt from being sued by anybody. Archbishop Lori, sorry, the guy's just looking like a crook. Dave Ryan. Hi. Ronan Wave. Turf War. The Archdiocese of Baltimore reaches all the way from the capital city of Annapolis through the city of Baltimore and beyond Cumberland to the state's western border. During the colonial period, the church supported Maryland's Catholics through a century of persecution. But today, in the nation's first diocese, those who stand for Catholic principles find themselves up against a corrupt alliance between the government and the church. The unholy alliance is between the Maryland Catholic Conference, or the MCC, and Democrat politicians. This is a fact Church Milton's resistance captain Duffy Kane knows all too well. We caught up to Duffy outside the State House in Annapolis where lawmakers were debating two new bills, 
House Bill 1171, which would make abortion a constitutional right in Maryland, and House Bill 937, which would provide taxpayer funding for abortion even to non-residents. Uh, 1171, uh, adding uh, abortion as a constitutional amendment. Well, that was uh, people in the House had that. Right. Well, but what do you think of that? Well, I don't think it was necessary in there, uh, particularly. I mean, it's been the law in Maryland since uh, 1994. But making it a constitutional amendment would make it nearly impossible to fight any other abortion legislation in the state of Maryland. Bill 937 is going to Governor Larry Hogan's desk. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is going to give $3.5 million a year to train literally anybody, non-medical professionals, to give abortions and allow anybody from any state to come to Maryland to get an abortion at expense of taxpayers in Maryland. Well, Do you think that's a good idea? Well, um, I don't know if I see the bill exactly that way, but... I don't know uh, how you can't when you, all you got to do is go to the Maryland website, hit fiscal policy and read the legislation. Well, I'm, I'm not anti-abortion. I think it ought to be carefully considered. Well, but, but it's okay to take taxpayer monies and fund abortion for anybody from any state? Well, but we don't have a bill that would fund it for people. 937 allows anybody well, from any state. I don't know state. what's in 937. I haven't seen it, and I haven't voted for it, so I don't know what that is. Okay, so you're saying that you didn't vote for that legislation? What, 937? Yeah, 937 that's going to Governor Hogan's office this that's, week. No, that's a, uh, yeah, House, no House it, does, it doesn't have funding in that bill. There's no funding in that bill. At $3.5 million a year? Yeah, it they, they was in the, uh, uh, the uh, Finance Committee. Well, I don't know of any funding for abortion. It, there might have been funding. No, it's funding for training oh, people. Well, well, for, people to give abortion. We're talking non-medical professionals. Well, no, they, they have to be a medical professional. That When we passed the bill, when the bill was passed in 91, okay. it only allowed physicians to do it. Okay, but that... And that, now, yeah, that's only that, that, but that's still, taking, that's still taking tax dollars from the state, uh, state of Maryland for anybody in the country to show up and get an abortion. Well, I, I don't think that's what it does. Well, okay, well, we'll, we'll check your record on that and get back to you on it. Thank you. What do you think about that? Uh, you want my honest opinion? You want one word that covers that? It's called bullshit. It's called bullshit. That's what you get from these people. You're paying these people, they're taking your tax dollars, and they're funding abortion and every other piece of garbage woke legislation, and you gotta keep paying them to do it. Or they send a guy with a gun to your house to take your property. It's called extortion. That's what I think of it. Don't porky pig on me. I don't know what I'm going to do, brother. I've never done this before, but I'll do my best. All right, here we go. Church Milton's own Joe Gallagher, as we said off the top of the show, is in the Terrapin State right now on special assignment and is standing by live at the state capital of Annapolis. Joe. We are not only here with the resistance member, we're here with the resistance regional captain, one of two, Duffy Kane. I'd say that we've become pretty good friends over the over the time. Last and, uh, couple of years. Duffy, we're out here, we're looking at a lot of the things going on when it comes to the legislation here, especially House Bill uh, 937, 1171, yeah. all those things, and the relationship that that has with all of the Catholics involved. So if you could share a little bit about that. Well, the Catholics that I'm involved with right now, we're, we're getting a constituency to begin to affect the testimony in the legislation and giving instruction on how basically citizens can take back their constitutional republic, but more importantly, how Catholics can begin to actually fight abortion legislation at the legislature level the, in the House and the Senate. So my wife and I, Rochelle, are basically getting those those teams together right now. 
All right, guys, we'll be back tomorrow and later on this week with much, much more. Absolutely. That's why you're there. Uh, Joe, please tell Duffy, thank you very much uh, for coming on there. He's you know, stepping out of his house into the cool uh, uh, spring evening there. But uh, don't thank you very much. And thank you especially for all of the work that he is doing. When we come back. Are we clear? Laura said thank you. Oh, that was hey awesome. Guys. Hey. Doug. Hey. Duffy. 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 Oh, okay. Duffy. Dan Cox. Oh, great. We're going to be on your. Uh, we're going to be on your. Uh, your Westminster Carroll Campaign. County. Campaign. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we're excited. Help you get He's running for so, governor. Is this the best right. way to reach you and try and get a hold of you? You know, it's funny. I just ran out of my campaign card, so that's all I have. But let me give you my cell. Sure. Um, yeah. Are you well, trying to get him in on the do the document? If we can, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Sure. Right, we're doing shooting. Right. It's uh, uh, tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. If we could get okay. some time to. Uh, I can probably give, if you're interested, I could give you a little bit of an insight on what we deal with down here. What's going on, man? What's going on. Glad, Glad you're, you're here, here, man. man. No, I think that would be awesome. I think that would be so. It would allow us for some great footage. I think state the interview house. would look really, really good as well. Did you say the yeah, state house? State okay, house. good. We will. Uh, want me to just text you when we get into the building? Sure. All right. All right. See you soon. Let's do this. This one too. No, no. Watch your head, Duffy. Look out, Duffy. Man, we can't take you anywhere. <laughs> A perk of on-the-ground investigations is what you run into, well, while you're on the ground. In this turf war, that was meeting Dan. Dan Cox is one of the few people in power who is not afraid of the wolves in sheep's clothing. In other words, Dan is one of the few who will not be bullied into silence. He will not sit back while his state and country gets destroyed. Harriet Tubman obviously being the uh, rescuer. Interestingly, she carried a gun, was Republican, and <laughs> saved hundreds if not thousands of lives. Frederick Douglass is well known for his oratory and defense of life, liberty. Dan has been in politics trying to echo Catholic teaching and conservative legislation, but has met obstacle after obstacle, not just from his Democratic counterparts, but most shockingly from his own shepherds, the Maryland Catholic Conference. Well, it's an honor to serve in the legislature as a pro-life Republican. And one of the things that we've learned in Maryland is that we have great traditions and history here. I mean, we're sitting in the room that the acts of toleration were passed in. This is the old house chamber. And this is the history that we have in Maryland. And I'm just so honored to have the opportunity. And what I've tried to do is bring that to bear on our principles so that our constitution is upheld. Was there a you know, straw that broke the camel's back moment for you when looking at the uh, current situation within the state of Maryland where you said, all right, that's it. I'm throwing my uh, my name in the hat. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try for governor. I'm gonna I'm going to enter that race. Interestingly enough, the thought process may have begun when the governor, who I supported, who claimed to be pro-life, attacked the pro-life caucus and attacked our GOP caucus as being as as should not be pro-life anymore. In the Baltimore Sun, yes, we're a big tent. But we are a pro-life party. We're one state in the middle of five around us that pays for abortions with our taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. So they traffic women into our state to cover over sex crimes, to provide uh, abortion tourism. During the pandemic, the governor locked our state down. He took away our liberties. For the first time in 400 years of history from this place, he took away our right to go to church, to attend mass, to do anything that we would normally do in 400 years but he left six abortion clinics open in Maryland. And two women almost died during the lockdowns from late-term botched abortions. They kept those abortion clinics open. It was sad, um, it was disgusting. It was, it was a moment of Maryland history that we're not proud of. It's evil, you're right. It's evil and it's crumbling right here. And so that was a motivation. That was really a motivation along with the other platform issues on my website, which is coxforfreedom.com. 
Oh yeah, we'll be supering that. Don't you <laughs> worry about that one bit. Um, you're a constitutional lawyer. You, you're probably pretty well versed as to uh, some of these procedural violations. Would you say that as your time as a part of the uh, Maryland legislature, do you see that type of stuff a lot? Frequently. Uh, you can imagine that in a, in a democracy, there has to be debate, right? That's what we're here for. Well, they could literally silence all of the dissenting debate at all times if, they, if they're going to be you know, tyrannical. That's ha that happens sometimes. Uh, just today and just yesterday, yesterday I think in particular, the speaker cut off debate in the middle of it. We were six votes shy today of stopping an override on the abortion bill, the horrific abortion bill. It, it, um, Nine, no, 937? HB 937 passed in the law by six votes. Uh, but sadly, some people didn't show up for the vote. Um, but really, on a veto override, it's not those who didn't show up so much as those who did show up. Because once they reach 85 votes, it's over. Why don't we coordinate a little better with some of the activists? You know, why don't we have thousands of people show up on an important key vote? If we did that at the right moment, mm -hmm. would we get those six extra votes? Yes, we would. And let me tell you why. We have 10 swing votes right now in the House. But some of those swing votes voted to override the governor on this because they didn't have any pressure. There's one voter base that uh, really punches above its weight class more than anything else, and that's actually Catholics. Of course, yes. and Catholics, they, they, they really turn out. Thank uh, God. Did you, yes, blessed be God. And the question is, did you see any of that uh, support, uh, or do you ever really see it from the MCC? Well, on the big ticket items, uh, sometimes, um, I was looking over, if I can just take a second, Absolutely. I was looking over on this uh, horrific abortion bill. So we did get a Catholic conference. I put in a, um, a one-pager, four paragraphs. Okay, let me tell you what that means. That means nothing. Okay, it might, it might seem uh, technically correct mm -hmm. because they put in, you know, oppose this bill, here's four, pa here's four paragraphs on a one-page. Um, I'm not misrepresenting it. I can email you the document if you'd like. Uh, and I appreciate the bishops uh, and I appreciate the Maryland Catholic Conference for putting the paper in because sometimes this is the problem in my committee. Sometimes we have life issues and they don't show up. In fact, uh, sometimes they're on the wrong side. There was a deal on the assisted suicide thing that bothered me. There were some other deals that Regarding they, with the MCC? Correct. Would you that's be willing to speak a little bit more? That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that um, there were some other deals as well. Um, the child abuse issue, the look back. The Hidden Predator Act. The Hidden Predator Act. Uh, there, was some, there were some deals there that were made that um, were basically, in my view, they were look the other way on some of these life issues so long as you protect the church from getting sued. Um, now that's what I was told. What have I observed? Tight-lipped, scripted statements and meaningless advocacy. And what I mean by that is exactly what you saw on this abortion bill. This is almost a permission slip. To have something so innocuous, this is communicating to the left that, yeah, you know we're against it officially, but we're not gonna mount an opposition. We're not gonna embarrass you. Mm -hmm. So open the gate. Yeah, and that speaks to, I mean, it leaves room for the imagination. Sure, I mean, if they're willing to do that type of thing, you know that there's relationships and there are discussions going on. Well, we know this. We know this you. is true. Uh, some, of their, some of their staff, I, I want to be cautious because I need to work with them and I love the, the good things they do. Um, but we know some of their staff is from the left side of the aisle. Uh, one of their attorneys I'm particularly familiar with is someone who I would view and I've understood has advocated on the other side of these issues. So I don't understand how they could have hired her. Mm -hmm. If I were advising the bishops, I would say, get your most pro-life people. The bishops need to understand that, um, w that we can't be played and that we shouldn't be played and that politics, they don't need to be, here's the thing, they don't need to be afraid. The statement is, well, if we took a bold stance, we won't get the deals we want in the back room. And the deals are what really saves us. The deal like not having uh, a look back tort on uh, the Sexual Predator Act. They want those deals and so they're 
publicly cautious to not shame anybody. And then they try to work out a deal in the back room. The problem with that is it's, a, it's almost a Marxist approach that gives the other side that two step forward, one step back. All they're doing is giving the other side that one step advantage every single time. And at the end of the day, you're going to lose it all anyway. Right. The way to express our faith has got to be out from under the bushel. Our candle has to be lit. It's got to be clear. It's got to be bright. And light will cause the darkness to flee. Absolutely. Because truth is on our side. Yeah. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you very, very My much. My honor. Thank you for the opportunity. Where's the Maryland Catholic Conference? Okay, there's about 50 people who voted or, or who, who gave, gave, gave testimony. Now, when, when Senator Bill Ferguson showed up on the floor and A said... A fake Catholic. When, yeah, fake Catholic. Uh, when he showed up on the floor and said, we have an unusually large number of unfavorable votes. It's right after Shelley and I had hooked up and started really working this legislation. And you can go through 25 pages of unfavorable testimony. So we know we hit the Richter scale. It was a good first effort. And I could see the names of, of our chapter members right there. So I looked at the one bill that we did, hadn't had a chance to work on it. It happened prior to us getting, getting into the, the legislative session. And I, so I looked at the people. I said there was about... There was about 50 people, about two thirds of them were unfavorable, one of which was the Maryland Catholic Conference. So we'll say there's about 35 people, one of them was the Maryland Catholic Conference, and there were 34 other unfavorable votes. Now what's the probability of those 34 people all being from the Maryland Catholic Conference? And, and the better yet, you know what, where is Archbishop Bill Lorry and all his like wonderfulness, right? Where, where's his name? I mean, I want to make an appointment with this guy and teach him how to get on the Maryland website and show his priests and, and, and his flock, you know, the shepherd, this guy is supposed to be leading us to heaven, uh, where his name appears right there on the Senate uh, document that says, hey, I oppose this bill. Where are you? In the current political climate, all seems lost. So many Americans feel as though they don't have the power to make any difference. But this is a lie. We the people do have the power to affect change in the church and in the culture. There are few people who know how to mobilize a grassroots base in a way that successfully disrupts the global agenda like this seasoned politician. He even wrote a book on how to do so. And it makes sense considering he spent over two decades as a delegate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Eric Chair will recognize the distinguished gentleman from Prince William, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know you'll put me on the Appropriations Committee. <laughs> he is also one of the originators of the Hyde Amendment, a historic landmark in the pro-life battle. Bob Marshall blazed the trail for today's conservative. He gave us some awesome insight on the process of what we the people can do to affect change. So you've, uh, you've obviously been working in legislation for a quite some time. So you might know a thing or two about how to disrupt the tactics of the left. If you look at what's going on, for example, in Maryland and how sneaky they are with their wording and with getting some of these bills passed, and even if you were to approach them, which Duffy did the other day, uh, they just lie through their teeth. They pick your words and it, it's, it's so conniving. Uh, can you talk about uh, any ideas, thoughts, or resources you know of, have, or made uh, that can help the average American, the average Catholic, get into this fight? Because I think a lot of people want to do something. They just don't know how to or where to start. You only have to have a few members of a state house to kind of whipsaw this thing around. And like I say, you don't need a lot, but you need a few who are willing to take flack from their leadership because they're forcing everybody to go on record and you need people to second the motion. Normally that's 20% of whatever a, a quorum is. So if a hundred people uh, is a quorum in a legislature, you need 20 people to demand a second for a record vote. What you want to do is put people on record so they can't hide. And the virtue of the Hyde Amendment was it's very clear what you're doing. You either want to fund abortion to kill children or you don't want to fund a, a tax money to kill children. That is easy to understand and it's easy to sell in the public arena. You can do this for anything. You can do this for, uh, you know, these some of these crazy sex ed programs. I, I put all this in a book that I wrote called Reclaiming the Republic that Tan 
uh, published. Oh, it was actually published by Tan. Pull, uh, pull it up. Show uh, so we. And can again, see it. it's a how-to manual on how to get legislation passed or defeat legislation, and it gives you the understanding that you need to to traverse the intricacies of the legislative process. It's not impossible, but it's not necessarily intuitive. It's based on experience. But I wrote down the experience in here that I had with 26 years in the legislature in Virginia. And by the way, I would, you know, I would get uh, amendments passed. We would even override the uh, governor on, on a bill that says we're not going to recognize out-of-state civil unions. It, it's just going through this process, being able to you know, throw all the dice on the table and get a record vote. But you have to follow up. You then take this information on the record vote and you give it to people to, to ask them, are you satisfied that your member of Congress or your state legislature is doing this? But knowledge, what is it? The book of Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you have the knowledge of, of Caesar's house, you can determine who goes into Caesar's house and who gets to sit in the living room. If you don't have that knowledge, you're, you're too easy to be manipulated. Sure. So what would you say to somebody in the... Uh... That would say, yeah, that sounds all fine and dandy, but it just sounds like a lot of work. And they're just you know, on the fence as to whether or not they want to do it. Well, if, if you don't want your children to be taken from you and propagandized in public schools with bizarre notions of human sexuality, this does take a lot of uh, sweat uh, because the devil's out here and he's got nothing but time on his hands to do this. And there, there's no way that we are in anything but a fight, one, for our salvation, and two, for our society. We are, you know, with our back against the wall. We're not totally off the charts, but you have got to fight if you're going to defend your family, because the other side is going to take everything away from you, including your children. Amen. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Marshall. Okay. Well, th thanks for the work you're doing in spreading this information. No. Blessed be God. There are few pro-life institutions that do not bow to the almighty dollar or to the intimidation of bully bishops. One such organization is Defend Life. For decades, Defend Life has brought the truth and horrors of abortion to the attention of the common public, with some members going so far as to be arrested. Jack Ames is the president and founder of Defend Life. We sat down with Jack to discuss his group, how they impacted the abortion Goliath, their wins and losses, and their unique tactic called the Face the Truth Tour. Jack, it's, uh, it's awesome. You've been doing pro-life work for longer than I have actually been alive. Could you talk about uh, Defend Life, when it sure. started, why it started, and how long you've been doing this work in general? The reason we started Defend Life is when I came to Maryland, and when I came to Baltimore, I thought I'm coming to the mother land of Catholicism in America because the first Catholics came to Maryland. They came to St. Mary's County. So I was under the assumption that all these wonderful Catholic parishes would exist and they would be vibrant seats of pro-life activism. How wrong I was. One of the great things that's going on in Defend Life is we get great Catholic speakers into parishes because Catholic parishes are the sleeping giant of the pro-life movement. I would say maybe one out of five parishes have anything significantly pro-life going on. Sadly, the other four don't, whatever reason. Weak bishops, uh, uh, or just a weak laity. Yeah, the lady's been dumbed down mm -hmm. by the, the lack of good preaching. So, so many Catholics are just going with the flow. And sure. where does the flow read? Straight to hell. Now, if I, if I, if I can ask, this is a, another question, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump to the signs that you have here. Uh, terms, language, uh, and, and what the left does with it, and how we as Catholics, people on the right, people that are fighting for truth, I need to take it back. Could you just speak to... Sure. Yes, and so many times they've actually, pro-lifers have bought into that. So where did the term choice come from? It actually, in the early years of the pro-life movement, um, we didn't have that term choice. And then the pro boards the Planned Parenthoods, the now has spent a lot of money on Madison Avenue. What can we do to dress up abortion? Because they knew abortion is evil. Anybody knows what abortion really is, knows it's evil. Well, Madison Avenue said, call it choice. And 
they have been so successful that pro-lifers use that term themselves. We have to use the words very clearly. So it's not an abortion clinic, it's an abortion mill. It's not a fetus, it's a preborn baby. And when we use the right language, we're much more effective. So what do we have here? Can you talk about uh, sure. some of these signs? And but one of the things we do that uses. makes us different than other pro-life groups is we do what we call face the truth tours. This is a first trimester aborted baby. Not pretty, but that's a real untouched photograph. Now, I'll tell you what we do with these images in a second. Here's a second trimester aborted baby. And then he's actually put back together. That's um, horrible. But that's a second trimester aborted baby between three and six months. And then here is a third trimester aborted baby. It's the head you can see of a baby hair. girl. You can see her hair. Yeah, yeah. Um, perfectly formed. So it's really important we show the pictures. So that's what we do in our Face the Truth tours. The pictures are so powerful. We have to use them. If we're not using them, we are missing the boat. It's like a great pitcher who suddenly is feeling sorry for his opposition. So he's only going to throw fastballs. He's not going to throw his fast and his curve and his slider. Well, guess what? When he does that, the other side is just waiting for that fastball, right? And they're going to knock it out of the park. We're here only a little while. If they take away everything from you, if they kill you, then you're a martyr. And then you go straight to heaven. So yes, whatever price we pay here will enable us to spend all eternity with Almighty God. That's what's the only thing that's really important. Not only to go to heaven ourselves, but to take as many of our friends and family with us as possible. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you, Joe. Very good. Church Militant's resistance is structured based off of dioceses. Every diocese has a chapter. And because resistance has grown so much, blessed be God, we have implemented an additional tier of leadership for our regions. Regional captains oversee multi-state conglomerates. Therefore, they oversee multiple chapters, sections throughout the country. After their effective work in Church Militant's legal battle with Baltimore and the Miku Pavilion for our Enough is Enough rally, Duffy and Roe Kane not only had the Baltimore chapter of resistance, but each cane oversees a specific region. From Florida to Maine, the canes are the go-to leaders for roughly a third of resistance chapters. We spoke about the need to fight, the future, resistance, and how bad things really are in the state of Maryland. Why do people choose to fight when you kind of really don't have to? Why try and get involved in a, to the extent that you are? We choose to fight because we believe in God. On the other end of the spectrum, they don't believe in God, or they are poorly catechized, or poor, poorly poorly schooled on on what God is, and they, or or they've made up a version of God that kind of works for what their 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 lifestyle. Okay, so the bottom line is is that we believe in the the, the deposit of faith of the Catholic Church. So let's talk a little bit, if we can, as to what you guys have seen, heard, discussed with some of your sources. Uh, from what you've seen, the Maryland Catholic Conference doesn't seem to be doing the Maryland Catholic thing. Conference thing. Mm -hmm. So 937 was the abortion bill that was up um, for, for veto, and Governor Hogan vetoed the bill actually last night. And then Maryland Catholic Conference put out a statement of several couple of days ago days that said, um, you don't need to really bother calling, it, it was kind of sneaky the way that they had written it, but basically it was, don't bother calling the governor and hounding the governor because he's going to veto this bill anyway. And they can't, they can't override, override right? the veto because it's his last term and he, they would be able to not override the veto. Basically, they could convene a, a special session at any point in time with a new governor if they wanted to before the next legislative session. And what they ended up doing is they already had a session set up this morning 
to where they were going to override 937, the veto on 937. Then which they did. Right. They did. The optics of the whole thing were Governor, Governor Hogan didn't want to go on, on record as spending $3.5 million a year and opening up the state of Maryland to being the abortion capital of, of the United States, or probably the planet, if you want to get right down to it. The Maryland Catholic Conference is doing virtually nothing about these abortion bills. As a matter of fact, uh, when you get into what happened with the Hidden Predator Act, I'm very sorry. There, there's been a bunch of flim-flam where they basically said, okay, we're not going to deal with these abortion bills if you squash the Hidden Predator Bill and keep people from suing the diocese because we're going to go bankrupt, although they own the land rights from downtown Baltimore out into, into, into Allegheny County. Okay, So the, the Archdiocese of Baltimore is not going to go bankrupt from being sued by anybody. Archbishop Lori, sorry, the guy's just looking like a crook. There is an attack on every single thing that is good, yeah. true, and beautiful. Yes. Everywhere. It, Everywhere. It could be from your children to mm -hmm. the rights as a parent to be able to teach, direct, and raise your children in, in, uh, in the faith. It's the, uh, uh, the attack on 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 procreation it's the attack on religion it's everything everything that's good is under attack to to see all of this filth and all of these attacks it's really stressful but it always centers back and comes back to one soul at a time yeah. and being able to just grab the person in front of you and reflect Christ to them because everybody wants to everybody wants to just you know change the world but nobody understands that you change the world one soul at a time. You change it locally. You change it. You change it by by you know being the kind of people that'll stand there and, and and field phone calls all night, just trying to teach people that they can they can gain a hold of their constitutional republic. Our founding fathers gave us a republic, and it is not a spectator sport. We can change the world, man. If it's to be, it's up to me. I've got to, I've got to do everything I can do to lead that. I'm just grateful. To, to be able to do this, to be in this fight, and, and to, uh, you know, just wake up and love my husband, love God, and move forward. I'm grateful, I'm grateful that, that, uh, that there's a platform out there for, for a springboard for literally anybody who really, really wants to do it. And, and, it's, and it's church militant. It's what Michael Voris and his, his, uh, his, mother's, his mother's prayer for her, her son. You know, that is something that is bigger than, than I think it. anybody at Church Milton, even Michael Warris, I think it's bigger than the, the, the sum of its parts. We are the Church Militant. That's, yes. that's what right. we are. You, this isn't some like, okay, time to escape. That People act as if we're already in the church triumphant and that this isn't all a fight, that right. this isn't all a battle when that couldn't even be close to true. I, I think a lot of my time will be in church purgative. <laughs> but um, alrighty. Uh, yeah, that's it. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. First thing I remember knowing is a lonesome whistle blowing and the youngest dream of going out to ride. On a freight train leaving the town, not knowing where I'm Are you, are you filming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm not as tough or as good looking as I used to be. Okay. But but his arms. Well, let's just. Okay, tell me when you're ready. All right. One. Just you, bro. You count it down. One, two, three, go. Okay, go. Go. Tell me when you're ready. Oh, oh you got it. And I turned 21 in prison, doing life without parole. No one. Hear me right, but mama tried, mama tried, mama tried to raise me better. But a pleading I denied, that leaves only me to blame. But mama tried, that leaves only me to blame. But mama tried.